All right, so um, let's talk more about Trump's taxes. You should not trust anybody who, who makes this comparison. If you see this on Twitter, and you're, all, you're seeing it this morning all over the place, people are going to say this. <clears throat> A typical uh, middle-class taxpayer might pay several thousand dollars, whatever, per year. Trump only paid seven hundred and fifty dollars in twenty seventeen, so therefore, it's totally unfair, right? No, anybody who gives you that comparison and tries to convince you that you've learned something because you compared Trump's total taxes to an average citizen, they are lying to you, or they don't know a frickin' thing about taxes. Those are the only two possibilities. Anybody who makes that comparison is a flat-out liar or they don't understand the field whatsoever. There, there's no way that that comparison makes sense. It's comparing a, a peanut to an elephant. They, have, they just are different things, and I'll explain why. All right? Let me explain for anybody who doesn't follow finance, doesn't do their own taxes, a little simple situation. I'm not claiming that this uh, equals Trump's taxes. It's a generic situation, right? So suppose you've got a company in one year, any, any year, that makes $2 billion in money coming in. So that's what they've earned from people paying them for their services or products. And they've got an expense of a billion dollars a year that is actual checks and money that they've given out. That would leave them, since they brought in $2 billion and only put out a billion in expenses, that's a billion dollars left over to spend on stuff. But if they also bought a lot of assets, let's say they bought buildings or computers or vehicles, you can do a thing called depreciation. Depreciation is instead of taking the cost of that thing and acting like you, you spent all your money the year that you bought it, so let's say you bought a, you bought a building and it was a million dollars. You don't write off the whole million as an expense the year that you bought it. The tax law says that you write off a little bit every year based on what the tax law says. If it's a building, maybe it's 15 years, for example, and you just spread it out as if it's an expense. So if you had a billion of these paper artificial expenses and a billion of real ones, the two of them would equal two billion, and that's all the money that you had coming in. So even though you made uh, half a billion dollars in cash, that's yours to keep. You made a half a billion dollars, it's yours to keep. You got a half a billion dollars in cash. On paper, you made nothing. And you don't have to pay taxes, federal income taxes, if you made nothing. Now, is that a bad situation? Is that unfair? Is that the rich people taking advantage of a tax loophole? Nope. <laughs> nope. This law about how to, how to deal with depreciation, and indeed uh, depreciation won't be the whole story with Trump's taxes. There will be other um, loopholes and things built into the law that he took advantage of. But everything that's in the tax law is there because both Democrats and Republicans, in all likelihood, thought it was a good idea. That all the smart people thought it was a good idea. Now, there are people who argue you should change the tax to a flat tax, etc. So there is always room for debate. But the point is, this, this idea of how to treat taxes, even for rich people, is not really controversial in, in the mainstream of people who understand finance. Find me a CPA, somebody who is an expert on taxes, who thinks that this is bad for society. You won't find any. There's nobody who understands this field who thinks that this is bad or should be changed. Now, when I say nobody, you can always find some, somebody who will say anything. But the mainstream Democrat, mainstream Republican, they're all in favor of this. There's, no, there's nobody on the other side of this. Now, the other thing you need to know is that when they say he didn't pay taxes, they're usually talking about federal income taxes. 
it doesn't mean that no taxes were paid. Indeed, he paid a bunch of salaries, and everybody who earned a salary paid taxes. So instead of the taxes coming out of here, it went to the people. The people had an income. They paid taxes, and that goes to the federal government. They, they also probably paid payroll taxes and Social Security and, you know, and, and other related things. That all goes to some government, either local or, or federal. Um, what about property taxes? Every big company, especially if you're a real estate company, have, have enormous property taxes. What about uh, suppliers? He's buying stuff from suppliers. They make a profit. They use the, the, once they get that profit, they pay taxes. Right? None of this happens, none of this, unless this happens. So why is it that the government and the IRS thinks it's a good idea to have a situation where sometimes big companies pay nothing? It's a good idea because you really, really want this other stuff. You want jobs, because if somebody has this job, the government doesn't have to support them. That's a big win. You want all these taxes. This is exactly what you want. Now, if this lasted forever, would that be good? What, what if a big company just never paid taxes? They just always found loopholes and just never paid taxes. Would that be good? Well, it actually would be pretty good for the reasons I just told you. Tons of taxes get paid, but it's a second-order effect. Now, remember, these, these suppliers who, uh, who made money because they sold stuff to the company, once they make their money, they go spend it again. That's called the multiplier effect in uh, economics. So these dollars that are generated by this business, it's not one dollar. This dollar goes to the supplier. The supplier buys his own, his own supplies. That dollar goes to the next person. That dollar goes to the next person and the next person. Every time that dollar changed hands, somebody paid taxes. Maybe sales tax, probably income tax if there was a profit there. So there's an enormous economic benefit from a company that pays no taxes. That's why it's allowed, because it's really, really good for the world. It's not a coincidence that um, Amazon has this situation. It's not a coincidence that there are lots of companies that have this situation. Here's what you need to know for your further lesson in economics with my awkward whiteboard. Here's a situation which might be somewhat typical for a company that's not paying federal income taxes. If you're, if you're a growing business, meaning that you're, you're plowing money into your business continually, it could be that your expenses are going up because let's say you're, you're buying a new building, you're investing in some infrastructure. You're just putting all kinds of money into that. Now, this could be real money, expenses, or depreciation, but it could be going up like crazy. At the same time, though, it's fine. Your bank will give you loans because your revenue is going up like crazy, too. And the hope is that someday you'll get to the point where you don't have to put in as much every year and you can just start harvesting the benefits. A good example of this is your cable company. The, the company that, that is digging ditches and putting cable in the ground and connecting one neighborhood after another. Every time they connect a neighborhood, they make money from that neighborhood. So, the, so that neighborhood that the cable company connected is now profitable. But the company itself is not profitable, only that neighborhood, because they have already put in two new neighborhoods that are not yet profitable. As those new ones become profitable... Now you've got three profitable ones. Yay! If you stopped it there, you could immediately get your expenses going down while your income goes up. Hey, you're making money and you're paying taxes. But why would you? You didn't start a company. You didn't start a company to get to some point and then just level off. You started a company to grow forever. And the best way to grow forever is to keep getting bank loans, to keep getting financing, private financing, etc. As long as your revenue is going up and it looks like it could cross over in the future, the banks will give you all the money you want. Um, people will buy all the stock that you want. You can give financing easily and cheaply. 
Now, I don't know if President Trump's situation is like the one I described, but what's important is neither do you. (laughs) We don't know. Uh, Now, maybe if I looked at the details of his tax returns, I could could deduce this. I'm not sure I could. But um, if the... If the news has not described to you if this is a normal situation of a growing company, is he, is he plowing his money back into assets that are creating jobs and, and creating other kinds of taxes? That's the best situation you could possibly have. Now, it turns out that as an attack on the president, it's really, really effective. Because how many people... How many people understand this little lesson that I just gave you? If you were to guess what percentage of the general public understands that you can't compare an average wage earner's uh, taxes to a big company and that there are good reasons you can't compare them, what percentage of the company do you think, or of the of the country, do you think knows that? I would say 20%. Tops, yeah, somebody's guessing 20%, somebody says 5%, 10%. It's somewhere in that range. It's definitely not more than 20%, but it's probably in the 5 to 20% range. Now, having explained it to you, we're good now, right? Everybody who sees an explanation like this, you know, they didn't used to know, but now they've seen the explanation. Oh, good. I guess that problem is solved. We used to be ignorant. But now we've been informed, so I guess, I guess we're all good. No, it doesn't work like that. It's not just that 20% of the country are the only ones who understand this. It is that 20% of the country might be the only ones capable of understanding it, which is a horrible thing to think. But it's true. Something like, I would guess this is true, something like maybe 20% of the public has the raw intellect and the enough you know, context and background and enough of a talent stack to even understand what I just said. It's kind of complicated. I would guess that there are a whole bunch of people who watched this, saw this maybe for the first time, some of you, and are saying to yourself, I think I kind of follow that, but I'm a little hazy on the depreciation part. I kind of need to see that explained a few more times which would be perfectly normal. Trust me, if you, if you go to school for you know, economics or accounting or something like that, the first time you're introduced to the idea of uh, cash flow being different from income and depreciation being this invisible expense, the first time you see this stuff, it doesn't really stick. You, you kind of need to you know, be introduced to it over and over again before it sticks. So as a political attack, it's just brilliant, but it is completely um, d- disreputable. Disreputable. It is, uh, it is not good behavior. <laughs> it, let, let's just say this. The attack on Trump's taxes, if they were honest players, this is what it would look like if the critics were honest. Okay? We thought we would find a whole bunch of criminal activity here. We didn't find any. Okay, that would be the first honest thing they would say, because unless they're hiding something, you know, waiting for later, and it seems unlikely, they found nothing. So the first thing they should say is all those things that we thought were going to be big problems, we didn't find any. That would that would be an honest statement. But instead, they've suggested that there are problems when it is not demonstrated that there is. Here is another example. If you look at CNN and the way they're covering it, they say stuff like this. Uh, President Trump has a $300 million loan personally guaranteed that's coming due. So you say to yourself, whoa, that, that's, that's bad, right? $300 million loan coming due? Sounds bad. And then you say to yourself, CNN would say, and what would you do if you needed $300 million and you're the president, and let's, say, let's say Russia might be a future place that you think you might get some money. What would you do? Would you be a little nice to Russia because it might help your 
financing later in your own personal life? That's the CNN, uh, the CNN uh, take. Let me explain to you what they don't know or are lying about. I don't know. They either don't know or they're lying. A large company with a large loan coming due, how, how should you value that? What, what should your brain do when you hear that there's a big company with a $300 million loan coming due? Here is the correct way to analyze that. So, that's it. That's the entire analysis. There's a big loan coming due in a big company. So, that is the most routine thing in the world. Do companies pay off their gigantic loans before they're due? Sometimes. Sometimes they just refinance. The only thing that matters is if the company is producing enough cash to pay the loan. If you're a bank and, and the, the loan is coming due, but the, you know, the borrower is making plenty of cash, that's all you care about. You don't care about his income statement. <clears throat> you don't care that on paper it looks like he's not making money. You care that his bank account is producing cash. Because you don't get paid with uh, conceptual money. You're the bank. You want actual money. If the company is producing actual money and it's enough to service the loan, the bank loves you. The bank will fight over you. The bank will compete for your business. They love to give you money. So which is this situation? Is this a situation where there's not enough cash flow and the president's really in trouble? Well, they've kind of suggested that, haven't they? They've kind of suggested that's the case. But they haven't demonstrated it. They've, they've produced no evidence to suggest that it's even a little bit of a problem. Might it be a problem? Sure. Sure, it might be a problem. But in most cases, it would not be. If they don't tell you, does he have enough cash flow to service the loan, they have told you nothing. The amount of the loan, irrelevant. The fact that it's coming due, irrelevant, if you have cash flow. That's all that matters. You tell me how much reporting there will be on cash flow. There won't be any, right? There won't be any reporting on cash flow because cash flow is a story that probably makes Trump look good. When Trump talked about his balance sheet before these taxes came out, when he was talking about them, do you, did you ever notice the way he talked? He talked about having a strong balance sheet and good cash flow. He did not say, on paper, I have a big income, because that would be dumb. What you want is the biggest cash flow and the smallest paper profit. Did he do that? Don't know, because the reporting is silent on his cash flow so far. So in other words, the people who understand how to look at this would say, wait a minute, I don't care about any of that stuff. There's nothing on the taxes that's really that important. What matters is the cash. And where's that reporting? Where's all the reporting on the cash, also known as the only thing that matters? All right. When you see, somebody says, next, explain uh, EBITDA. We won't be explaining that today. <laughs> um, keep it easy. 